الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد. We begin a chapter today, and inshallah, I'll try to push into the next chapter as well. Um, these are incredibly important for people's personal ibadat. These above here have to do with your ibadah. And that's why they're very important for people to study and comprehend and understand. They are not just chapters, I mean, sometimes we study chapters that may not be so applicable to us today. Yani in some aspects that we study, it's still important to study because we need to know how the Sharia works, right? For example, if you're not interested in business, you still need to know how the Sharia governs business, but you may be like, okay, it's not only really practical, but you study it. But every one of us makes Salah. So the above that have to do with Tahara and Salah and Siyam and Hajj and things, we really need to understand well. This is the Bab Salat al-Ahl al adhar This is the chapter about the Salah, the prayer of those that have a, uh, يعني, a handicap, disability, something that's preventing them, something that is going to not allow them to make Salah like everybody else, right? And they're going to be different. We're going to go over four different things. One is going to be Salatul Marib, the Salah of the sick person. And that's a very important bab, even though, mashallah, you may be healthy now, alhamdulillah, but at some time, you might get into accident, may Allah protect us all. You might get sick, somebody sick may come ask you. Definitely somebody from your family is going to ask you these questions and things. So to understand this correctly is very important. The second thing will be the Salah of the Traveler. And we'll get into it in this bab, and the next bab is, is going to discuss it even more, which is going to be the, the, the shortening and combining of Salawat. And no doubt, all of us are going to travel sometime in our lives, so this is very important for us as well. And those that are in peril, those that are going through hardships, those that are in fear, those that uh, yani have a situation, where they are unable to pray, even if they're not physically sick or in traveling, but there are some, uh, yani, and we'll discuss the different types there, inshallah. And the prayer, which is going to be, for example, uh, on a moving uh, vehicle, right? And we talk about the safina, we talk about the boats in the fiqh books, but obviously for us today, we have to deal with planes, trains, other things as well. And we use the same principles here to derive, this is where Qiyas comes in, how to properly use Qiyas, because Sahaba, they prayed on boats. So looking at that, we talk about how do you pray on planes, for example, Nafal and Fard Salah and sitting and standing, and we'll discuss all of that. Under the chapter about Salatul Marib, the person who is sick and their Salah, there are five important lessons I want you to walk away with. One is, what is the ruling on the Qiyam, on the standing? And what are the ruling about the Ruku' and Sujood is number two. The Qiyam, Ruku' Sujood. What are the rulings on the sick? How sick? How well? How would you deal with that situation? Huh? Number three, what is the ruling if your Hal changes? Somebody starts Salah standing, then they get sick, or they get some pain, or something happens, they have to sit. What about you salah, start the Salah sitting, and then you feel better? What do you do in that condition? What if you are able to start the Salah standing, but then you cannot get up from sitting? Or you could start sitting, but then you won't be able to stand. Right? In those situations, and when the Hal, the condition changes, Next, when you are able to partially make the Salah correctly and partially you're unable. Meaning some people, they can either sit and make sujood on the ground, but they cannot stand up for Qiyam. And if they stand for Qiyam, they're not able to go to sujood. So what should they do? Should they prefer Qiyam or sujood? Fifth, understanding that if somebody is physically capable, Physically, they're capable, 
but due to some yani, situation, they still have to pray in a way that is like the people of Adha. Right? And, and what does that mean? Tell you. Let's say you're on a plane. You get your time, let's say you're flying from here to Dubai. It's a long flight, 14, 17 hours, whatever. Now, you want, you can combine salawat, you're in, you're in suffer, right? But, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, sometimes I've prayed six salawat on that plane, on one flight. Right? So you have all those salawat, and now physically you can get up. You're not sick, you're not, you don't have any back problems, but the security tells you you cannot get out of your seat. What do you do now? Right? Now, in other situations like floods, storms, any things like this where sometimes there is khawf, there is the fear, you have an enemy, they have guns. Like, may Allah protect our brothers and sisters in China. Many of them, they're in this situation that they're put in these camps and they cannot make salah. Even though physically they can, but due to some oppression. And that's not the same as salat al-khawf. Salat al-khawf done during jihad is different. Khair. So when we begin, what is the first thing the mullif begins with the bab? Talzamu al marida al salatuhu qa'iman. What does he begin with? The mullif here begins with setting the base, which is what? That for the sick person, it is obligatory upon them to pray standing. Okay? And this is very important because yani, some people they don't understand these ahkam. I saw a brother praying sitting, fard salah. And I told him, Akhi, everything okay? He told me I have a cold. I said, Akhi, you have a cold? Does it stop you from standing? Like, is it a fever? Can you not? He goes, no, I could stand, but I'm sick, so I'm going to sit. So, no, no, that's not the way it works, right? So what does the mullet here tell you? That what is the asal, what is the original state? That even if you are sick, you must pray standing. Al-Buhuti in his Rawt al in his Sharh of Zad al-Mustakni'ah, he says, same for Ruku and Sujood. Yani what is the Asal, what is the original that even if you're sick, you must make Qiyam, stand, must make Ruku, must make Sujood. Huh? He goes, the Mu'allif then says, وَإِن لَمْ يَسْتَتِيعَ فَقَاعِدًا If they are unable to, then Siri. So now this is an important exception. If due to their sickness, whether it is back pain or physical pain or some kind of, may Allah protect us all, cancers, whatever. If they're physically unable to stand, then they pray sitting. وَإِن عَجِزَ And if they are unable to pray sitting, then what do they, what do, they do? عَلَى جَنْبِهِ then they pray on their side. Okay, so now this is the first thing. If they're able to stand, then they must make the qiyam, ruku, sujood properly. Even if they're sick. If they're physically unable to, then they sit down. For example, yani we can sit on a chair. Or as Bhuti mentions in the earlier times, he says they should sit cross-legged, uh, Unfolded legs for rukur and sujood sitting like tashahud. So there are these guidelines given. In hadith, we don't find anything explicit about what does it mean to sit and be on the side. Yani, the dalil for these rulings is no doubt the hadith that is yani, uh, alhamdulillah mentioned Sahih al-Bukhari from uh, uh, Imran ibn Hussein uh, radiallahu anhu from Rasulullah sallallahu sallam when he was asked about the salah of the person who was unable to he says sal qa'iman you should pray standing and that is exactly as the matan tells you right for in lam yastati' in lam tastati' and if you are unable to faqa'idan then sitting wa in lam tastati' and if unable to, then on the side. I always find it very interesting when the matan, the wording is almost exactly from the hadith. Right? So, what does that tell you? That is the base ruling. But some people, they've made up this thing on the side, means like this and like this. But really, we don't find that in hadith. Hmm? 
ulama they give some explanations right so what do they say that what does it mean to sit you can sit for example cross-legged or like on a chair what you have to do is to illustrate with your body the difference between qiyam ruku and sujood meaning if you're sitting you will go down further for ruku and then further than that for sujood right why because you have to differentiate between the halat, between qiyam, ruku, and sujood. But there is no like particular way that mentions your hand should be 13 inches from here and 12 foot from there. And a lot of these things that are made up are made up. Okay? What we know is this is a rukhsa, this is a lenience from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whoever, if you are sick, can stand, make ruku, sujood, qiyam, should do so. If they cannot, the next is they sit down. If they're unable to, then on their side. Which side? The hadith does not mention. But as many of the imma and ulama, like Ghuti and Rawdul Murbi and others have mentioned, then they preferred the right side. Why? Because Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi would always do everything good on their on his right. So he said, if you can only choose one side, then you pray on your right side. That is preferable. If you are unable to pray on your right side, then your left side. Hmm. Tayyib. And if the person, the mu'allif continues, for in Salah, if he prays mustaqbilan, يعني, facing the qibla, and his legs, رجله إلى القبلة فيه, صح, يعني, it is correct. What does that mean? If a person is unable to even pray on their side, they're unable to stand, they're unable to sit, they're unable to be on their side, then they lay with their back on the ground, with their feet towards the qibla, and this salah is correct. Tayyib, now I know from adab and etiquettes many times people do not like somebody pointing their feet towards the qibla and things. Don't take this as a dalil for that to be permissible because this has to do with the inability when a person is unable to. Khair, there is no hadith that says you cannot point your feet towards the qibla either. But this is something done out of etiquette, out of respect for the qibla. There are a hadith that forbid us for example, qada al-haja. And when you, do, when you are not inside, when you don't have a wall barrier between you and the qibla, not to face or turn your back toward the qibla, to show ihtaram, to show respect for the qibla. There are a hadith for not spitting in the direction of the qibla. And if you do spit in the direction of the qibla, then that spit would be thrown back on you. Today something we don't worry about. There is hadith on this. Khair, hmm? back to the bab. So what do they say? They said, if they are unable to even be on the side, then they pray with their back on the ground, straight, facing their feet towards the qibla. And this is acceptable due to that necessity. But what do you have to do? You have to make the, to the best of your ability in all of these situations, your ruku' and sujood to be lower than your qiyam. So even if you're on your side, even if you're sitting, you make your ruku' to be lower than your qiyam. And you make your sujood to be lower than, than your ruku' to the best of your ability. Right? There is no like you have to get to this level and that level. You see some of these instruction videos, they just kind of make things up. I mean, we have to base things on a dilla. Here, this is not a regular salah. This is somebody who has a pain, who has an illness. So they do to the best of their ability. And if they are unable to, in ajaza, if they are unable to do any of that, then what do they do? Be aini, be with the eyes. Hmm? They pray with their eyes. Meaning, if they are unable to stand, they are unable to sit, they're unable to pray on their side, they're unable to even lay on their back and try to move a little bit, then you, like people are paralyzed completely. Then they pray with their eyes. How is the prayer of the eyes? Again, there is no hadith that says you go like this and then like this. No. What the ulama, they explain in their shuruh, in their explanations, that they look straight, for example, for qiyam. And then they look a little bit lower for ruku' and they look lower than that for sujood and so on to the best of their ability, with their eyes, to illustrate the movements of Salah. Tayyib. Now, فَإِنْ قَدِرَ أَوْ عَجَزَ 
if somebody becomes capable or incapable athna'iha yani during the salah then what do they do they change to the other position right? what does that mean if somebody is incapable of getting up and making salah they're unable to stand they sit down they begin their salah then they realize that alhamdulillah maybe they had like a really severe cramp they couldn't stand now that goes away during salah should they just continue like i started like this let me just go no now they have to stand up and they have to pray salah in accordance to what they are capable regular salah if somebody begins a salah and suddenly may allah protect us all they get some kind of a heart attack or something uh, or yani, something that they are unable to now stand and make salah they want to try to finish the salah they sit down or whatever they can do if it's very easy they break the salah but if they're able to then they continue the salah but they change to the hat right and this is something that yani, uh, obviously we understand that from the qaida from the principle that a muslim was baligh and aqil then salah is obligatory upon him in every condition so if they are able to sit and make it they sit and make it if they're able to stand they cannot sit and if they're unable to stand they don't just leave the salah if they can they continue the salah sitting and if one is able to stand in qadira al qiyam and sit but unable to perform ruku' and sujood huh? they're able to do qiyam quud do no ruku' or sujood or or yani they're able to be ruku' qa'iman or sujood qa'iman yani if one is able to stand and sit but unable to perform ruku' and sujood then what do they do they gesture for the ruku' and sujood standing and sits for sujood yani so what do they do if you are standing and you are unable to sit because if you sit you cannot stand back up so what do they do they can make a gesture for ruku' and sit down for sujood and stay sitting you guys understand i don't understand I want to make sure the surah al-masala has to be understood right if you begin the salah standing but you know that once you go into sujood you cannot get back up huh? so you make a gesture for ruku' but you go into sujood and then you pray the rest of it sitting why because sujood is and this is bina al khilaf al ulama there's discussion of ulama on this issue i'm not going to go deep into the disagreements rather to give you what's important here is sujood is from the most important aspects of the salah this is when you're closest to your rat so even here you start the qiyam standing you don't make tark of the sujood to continue the qiyam you do your qiyam standing the ruku you make ishara because if you go for ruku and you're unable to stand or unable to not go for sujood then you will get the ruku but you will not get the others but you give preference to the sujood So now you go into sujood you make the sujood even if you're unable to now get up for qiyam in the shuruh it discusses now more details for example if you're either able to do qiyam or sujood either you're going to start standing and now you cannot go into sujood or you're going to sujood meaning you start sitting and you will not be able to make qiyam they say you pray sitting so you make the sujood you give that preference because you're unable to stand back up from it and someone who sits and can pray but cannot stand back up and if they are able to sit al marid they are able to sit but they're unable to stand back up like i said in the shuruh what they have explained is that they should then prefer the sujood over the qiyam tayyib and if there is al marid there is a person who is sick and they're able to pray yani huwa qadir 
but they are told by Tabib al-Muslim, by a trustworthy Muslim doctor, that it will harm them to pray in that way, then they're able to pray sitting to protect themselves from physical harm. And this is the category I talked about earlier, about those that could pray, but due to circ circumstances, they still pray in a way that is like the sick, even though they're not sick at that time. Meaning, if you go to a reliable Muslim, trustworthy doctor, the Matan mentioned, the Tabib al-Muslim, and they tell you that if you pray standing, you will have, may Allah protect us, let's say a, a, a back spasm, and then you will not be able to stand up after that. And they're reliable doctors, not just some quack, not just some any kafir who's against Islam, or some Muslim doc, guy who does, who's not a doctor, like some guy just walks up, he's like, you know, I don't know anything about medicine, but my expert opinion is, well, if you don't know anything about medicine, keep your opinion to yourself. Huh? But if you have somebody, a reliable Muslim doctor tells you, if you pray in this way, you're going to have a stroke, you're going to have kidney, but whatever harm that could come, they have an actual reason for it, then to prevent that physical harm, you can pray the Salah of a Marib. Tayyib. Wala tasih. And it is not correct. Salatuhu qa'idan fi safina wa huwa qadir al qiyam. The matan here now mentions that if somebody is able to pray standing on a ship, it is not acceptable for them to pray sitting. Now this is a very important mas'ala for us. Why? I don't know, most of you may not go on ships a lot, but we do fly a lot. Right? And many people have fatwas now, mashallah, from their pockets. Right? That if you're on a plane, you can make all your salawat in the end of the day. That's wrong. No. What is jama' bin a khamsa salawat? Where did this come from? Right? Some people that tell you, you're on a plane, khalas, you can sit and pray all your salawat sitting, no problem. No. If you are able, Qadr, if you are capable to stand and make your salah on a train, on a plane, on a ship, you should. Now, if you are unable to, and this may be due to security reasons, and I've been on planes where they've told me you cannot get out of your seat. Right? Here now, you are under the hukam of the one that is not able to. Right? We discussed this category, even though you're not sick. Here, if you can make jama' bayna salatayn, if you can combine between two salawat, for example, you're going to fly from LAX. You get out of San Diego, before you get to the airport, you pray Dhuhr Asr together in the time of war. And by the time you get to your destination, it's time for Isha. So then you pray your Dhuhr Asr at LAX, you get there and you pray Maghrib Isha together on the ground. Khalas, no problem. But like I mentioned, some long flights, you're going to get five, six salawat. Here, you cannot just combine them all together. What do you do here? Is you try. You talk to the air hostess, you talk to them, say, I need to pray. And many Muslim airlines, it's getting any more difficult because I fly a lot, I know. But many of them, usually they would let you get up. Alhamdulillah, Saudi, for example, may Allah reward their airline. They have a whole musallah. It's excellent. Whatever people criticize, that's something wonderful. Service, I don't know. But anyway. uh, so you can get up and you can go and you can make salah in that musalla. Alhamdulillah. Right? No problem there. Many other airlines, Muslim airlines, you can easily talk to them and they sometimes will give you that area where the carts and things are in the back and you can make salah there. Alhamdulillah. If they tell you, no, you cannot. You cannot get up. And now the jama, the combined salawat are also going to lose their time. Meaning, you got on the plane before the time of Dhuhr. And by the time you land, it's going to be Maghrib. So now you have to pray sitting. Even though you could physically do it, right? If they don't allow you for security reasons, don't get kicked off the plane and sent to any, some kind of detention center because you're like, no. no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the, the hal, the condition. Huh? But if you are able to, on the plane, you should stand up and make your salah. If you are able to. Tayyib. And one can pray the salawat on their riding animal 
under now two subcategories. One is that you are praying nafal. Nafal salah, even if you're not sick, even if you have no problem, you're perfectly fine. But you want to pray nawafil while traveling. And this is from the sunnah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to make nafal salawat on his camel while traveling when he wasn't sick, while sitting on his camel. What do you do there? You face the qibla, you make your takbir facing the qibla, and then even if the camel or the car or the train or the plane or the ship or the boat changes direction from the qibla, you continue your thought. Facing whichever way the, the car is going, even away from the qibla, as long as you started your nafal salah facing the qibla. Who is this for? Everybody, even if you're perfectly fine, healthy. Because in nafal salawat, you have that need. But for the fard salawat, we're talking about al-fard, al-rihal, yani upon the, uh, the uh, yani, uh, transportation. Hmm? And if they are afraid or unable to get up, right? for example, you're on the plane and you have to pray your fard sitting now. You can in that situation, but you have to continue facing the qibla throughout. There's a difference now between fard and nafal. In the fard, you cannot pray it sitting unless you have an shari'i excuse. Meaning if you're healthy and capable, you stop your car, you get down, you make your salah. Huh? You stop your horse ride, you put your horse, tie him up, whatever, and make your salah on the ground. You cannot do it on, the, on, on your horse or on your car. If you're on a train, obviously you can't stop the train and get out. Huh? But you pray on the train standing, if you're able. You pray on that plane standing. You pray on that uh, boat standing, if you're capable. If you are unable and you have to make your fard salah sitting on your ride, whether it's a camel, whether it's a horse, whether it's a car, whether it's a train, whether it's a plane, then the difference here is for the fard, you have to have an excuse. And secondly, you have to continue facing the qibla. If the animal or the car changes, you have to continue to do your best to face the qibla. On planes, which is mostly what we run into, usually they'll give you a map. And Muslim airlines will even show you the qibla. But on even non-Muslim airlines, if you choose the little entertainment thing, they have your, your flight, they'll show which way your flight is going. You can see the qibla. And if you start your salah facing the qibla, the plane doesn't make U-turns and things, you know. It's not going to change the qibla any until you finish your salah. For the next salah, you check again. And you face yourself in the seat, even if you have to face the window or the back or whatever, to face the qibla throughout your fard salawat. Tayyib. Now, this is going to be uh, as much as possible. And this is going to be for the one who is capable. The one who is sick, prays sitting and does their best, but they are not obligated now because they are incapable to do those things. So the, for the one who is capable, they do their best. I mean, they do their best to face the qibla, to stand, to sit. And the one who is sick and unable to, then they pray any which way they can to the to their ability, they don't strive past their ability. Meaning, you don't tell somebody who is unable to stand, oh, come on, be a man, stand up, take the pain. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not put upon us more than we can bear. Inshallah, we'll continue into the next bab, or next fasal, it's not another bab, which is the salah of the one who is going to shorten, al-qasr. And this is very, very important because all of us throughout our life run into this situation, whether it's due to travel. And then we'll talk about jama ah and the different reasons for jama, ah, for combining, right? whether it's used to rain or whatever else. The mu'allif here begins with, with qasr before jama. Ah. He begins with the shortening before the combining. So there are, these are two different things. One is qasr which is to shorten, one is jama, ah, which is to combine. Some people think that everything that has jama ah has qasr, 
and qasr has jam'ah. This is incorrect. Everything that has qasr has jam'ah, jawazan, permissibility wise. And I'll explain all this as we go. But jam'ah combining does not necessitate qasr, shortening. You understand the principle? If you shorten, you can definitely combine. But if you combine, it does not mean you can shorten. Tayyib. In essence, qasr, shortening is only for one thing. What is that? Travel. Travel. That's it. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has orders in the Quran and Sahih Ahadith Mutawatiran, we have qasr for travel. For traveling. There is one exception which most of the shuruh don't even mention. And that is Salat al Khawf. But Salat al Khawf does not have qasr the way you do for traveling. You don't make duhr two. But Salat al Khawf, there is raka'ah. You can make one raka'ah and then you will continue and so on and so on. And we'll get into that inshallah. But the essence is that there is no reason to shorten except travel. Okay? And you will find most of the shuruh will mention this. What about jama'ah? What about combining? There are many reasons for combining. Traveling is one of them. But there is also sickness. There is also rain for Maghrib and Isha. Huh? There are also other reasonings for people out of dire necessity, women out of during times of hardships of pregnancy and breastfeeding and so on and so on. There are other reasons for jama'ah, for combining. But those reasons Unless it's travel, you cannot make qasr of it. For example, if it rains, and it's heavy rain that wets the clothes, and it's the dark salawat, yani maghrib and isha, and you combine them in the masjid, not at home, you're not going to pray three maghrib and two isha. Or you're going to pray them four. If there is somebody who's sick, and due to their sickness, they're going to combine. And, and they've consulted a Muslim scholar that they, they, their, their sickness is such seriousness that they can, they don't make qasr. They do not make it short. They can combine but not shorten. Shortening is in essence only for traveling. Tayyib. The mu'allaf here, he mentions in the matan, man safara, whoever travels. Safran mubahan. A traveling that is permissible. Tell you. Who can shorten and qasr, and this will come under jama'ah as well. Is, some, is there going to be three conditions that we're going to put right now? First is they have to be travelers. For qasr, you cannot be sitting at home and going, you know what, I don't feel good today, I'm just going to make two rakah dhuhr. Huh? You cannot go across the street to a friend's house and be like, you know what, I'm over here, it's not my house, I'm going to make qasr. No. You have to be a musafir. And we'll explain what that is, inshallah, be adilla with evidences. But the other shart, which there is khilaf to ulama on this issue, I mean, the, no doubt to the, the, there is khilaf, is that this safar, this traveling has to be mubah. This has to be something permissible. Tayyib. There are five types of traveling. And this five is Usul al Khamsa. You guys, those that have been in our Durus, you know them. Huh? There can be traveling that's haram. Huh? It's haram traveling. There can be traveling that's makru, that's karaha, it's disliked. Hmm? There can be traveling that's mubah, that's permissible, there's no reward, there's no sin. There is traveling that's mustahab. There is traveling that's obligatory, fard. Hmm? So everything from mubah onwards of what I mentioned, you can make qasr, you can shorten, and make jama'ah. But that which is haram or makru, you cannot make qasr or jama'ah, according to the madhab. And this is not just a hanabala, this is the qawl, one of the opinions given to Imam Malik and a Shafi'i, and a Shaykh al-Azab ibn Taymiyyah and others mentioned, this is Jumhur al-Ulema. And this has been mentioned very explicitly from Mujahid the Tabi'i as well. Abu Hanifa rahmatullah he took a different view. He took that even if you are traveling for a sinful reason, 
you can make tasar. And many of our more contemporary ulama took that view as well. Having said that, no doubt what is correct, if we look at the evidences, is that this is a, a rukhsa, this is a sadaqah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the khilaf, and I don't want to go too detailed here, gets into whether this is the leniency or is two rak'ah the asal? Aisha radiyallahu anha, she mentioned that the salah used to be two rak'ah. I mean, dhuhr and asr, and uh, yani Aisha, maghrib is three and fajr is two. And then it was increased for the muqeem and kept at two for the musaf. So here, based on this, Abu Hanifa, he took the view that because that's the asal, even if you're being sinful in your travel, you're only going back to the asal, so you can use it. But this is incorrect. Why? Because we have the hadith from Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, and I'll summarize from it, and it's in Sahih Muslim. Where he told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that يعني, in the time there used to be khawf, there used to be fear, and that's why people made qasr. They were, they were combining and they were shortening. Any qasr, they were shortening. And now we don't have, at the time when peace had come in Medina and يعني, and so on, we don't have that. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sadaqatun. This is a sadaqa, tasadda, يعني, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to you as a sadaqa, sadaqa from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alaykum, from him. فَقْبَلُهُ يعني So accept sadaqatuhu, accept his sadaqah. What does that tell you? That this is the rukhsa, this is a sadaqah. This is not the asr. So because of this marfu' hadith, this explicit hadith from the Prophet ﷺ, we understand what is correct is this is a leniency. And the leniency in sharia is to make something easy for you. And the sharia, the qawaid and the usul of the sharia, the maqasid of the sharia is that it makes easy for you good, not haram. You understand? Or you don't understand? It's kind of a little bit deep because it's not like this, okay, here's the hadith. I want you to understand this issue. Because many of our brothers today, when they study, they're like, oh, no, no, Sheikh Fulan said that they just go for it. No, you understand the depth of how the sharia works. Why do we have a rukhsa, a leniency of combining and shortening and, and making masha for three days and so on for traveler is to make the hardships of that travel easy for you to get to your destination. If your destination is good, like it's something far, like you're going for hajj or jihad or talabut ilm or something like this, great. Obviously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you that sadaqah for that good that you're doing. If it's something mustahab, something good, Maybe you're going for Umrah, you've already done Umrah, you've already done Hajj, but you're going again, Alhamdulillah. Maybe it's Mubah, something permissible, even if, you know, maybe you're just going to go and eat some good halal food somewhere, it's Mubah. Allah gives you that Sadaqah. But Allah doesn't give you Sadaqah to make easy for you to do Haram. You cannot be like, I'm going to go to Vegas and I need to grow my dice and gamble and drink, and I want Allah to make my Salah easy for me. For it. This goes against the Maqasid, the principles of the Sharia. Huh? So for this, the shart of it being something mubah, permissible, or mustahab, or wajib, alhamdulillah. But things that there is karaha, things that there is tahreem, you do not then make qasr or jama'ah for it. Tayyib. Arba'a burdin. Burdin, this is a unit of measure of how far the distance should be. Tayyip. Now we have some khilaf of ulema, first and foremost. But the Jamhur al-Ulema have taken this opinion. And this you will find in the Hanabal and Shawafi and the Malikiya and the Hanafiya and all of them. That the distance for travel should be for Burr. How much is that today? For this we have uh, Ibn Qudama for example He mentions from Imam Ahmad That sitta The six, sixth of Ashar Sixteen uh, Farsakhan Which is a unit of measure that was used And the Al-Farsakh It used to be Thalatha Amyal Three miles 
These are Hashemi miles, by the way. So that comes out to be Thamania Warbain, 48 miles. Now, having said that, these are estimates. And they are based upon rawayat, uh, narrations from Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma and Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma and other Sahaba. Narration of Anas ibn Malik and things we can discuss as well. But the narration from Abdullah ibn Abbas, and this is a very important narration because there is an opinion amongst the ulema of Islam that there is no set distance. Anything that is considered a traveler, orphan, in the customs of a land, you can make jam al qasab But I can tell you that this is a very rare opinion if you take the Jamhur al ulama Including the four madahib and stuff, they did not take this opinion. And it is an opinion that is open to a lot of misuse. I have seen brothers myself that were going less than a mile away from their house, Combining salawat. <laughs> it opens up abuse. And that is why we always go back to the salaf, to the sahaba and their aqwal and their practices. The hadith from Abdullah ibn Abbas, some of the ulema criticized it, saying that as Darqutni has mentioned in Al-Bayhaqi and al nawawi graded to be da'if. But what they miss in that is that da'af is in the marfu rawayah. When Abdullah ibn Abbas said that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, rather mawqoofan, yani from the statement of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, it is sahih. And it is supported by the narration of Abdullah ibn Umar and others. What does that tell us? Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he says, Ya Ahlul Makkah, O people of Makkah, O Makkah, la taqsuru, do not make qasr, do not shorn your salah unless you are going arba burdin. Unless you go for Burd. And then he gave Min Makkah Al Usfan. And other riwayat, he mentioned other areas as well from Judda, not Jidda, but Judda, Il Al Ta'if, Wa Ta'if Il Al Makkah. He gave these different ways. Now, if you measure them out, and I sat there on maps and measured these out, they're not going to be exactly the same. And that's why the ulema gave a range. For Burd is mentioned in Hadith. From Abdullah ibn Abbas that is for sure. So when we have no marfu hadith, and Rasulullah did not set a distance, that is correct. But we do have a mawquf sahih narration from multiple sahaba that set a particular destination. Then we should take this. If you go into the other rawat from Anas ibn Malik and others, they are not sarih, they are not clear. But from Abdullah ibn Abbas, this is sarihan. This is very explicit and clear. So we take this to be an evidence, as the Imam al-Arba and their madhaib have taken. And they, they gave about 48 Hashimi miles. In some books, they mention 47. In some, they mention 50. I mean, which is today's miles, it will be about 50, because the Hashimi miles are different. And in kilometers, some of the Imam and ulema, Sheikh Sheikh Ibn Baz and others, they mentioned 80 kilometers. Other ulema mentioned 83, some mentioned 88. I've seen up to 100. What is the essence here? The essence here is that this is four burr. And this is about how far it is, about 80 kilometers. Which would be about 80, 47, 48 Hashimi miles, around 50 miles. But you do not need to take your inchy measure tape out. This is not one of those things that if you're one foot this way or that way, you're going to now not... In essence, if your destination where you're going to travel is around more than 45 to 50 kilo, uh, miles, then khalas, you're a musafir. But if it's way less than that, let's say it's 20 miles or something like this, then you're no longer, you're not a musafir. This is still within the bound of where you would be. And this is why the different locations given from Ta'if, from Mecca, from Jidda, Ta'if, and uh, so on, are given by Ibn Abbas to show that this is around that range. So we take that as a range, and you say that the distance has to be that much. What does that mean? That means that if the destination is, not that you are, you have to make that, uh, meaning for example, if you're leaving from San Diego, not La Mesa, not Escondido, not Alcon, city of San Diego, 
and your destination is Santa Barbara. Well, that's definitely more than yani, 80, 88 kilometers, right? More than 40, 50 miles. Now, when you leave the buildings of your city, you can now make Qasr and Jama. Not when you're still in San Diego. Not that you're at home, you're making Qasr and Jama, and then you're setting out. No. But when you leave the buildings of San Diego, if you reach a city that's other than San Diego, for example, Encinitas, I think that's a city, right? It's not a suburb. Encinitas. You reach the city of Encinitas, or Oceanside, or whatever. Now you're outside of San Diego, and your destination is the it is further than the Shari'i minimum. Now you can make Jama, you can combine Salawat, and you can make Qasr. If you're still in San Diego, you cannot. And when you reach your destination, when you reach to Santa Barbara, on the way, no doubt you can do it. When you reach there, if you're going to stay there less than the, the, the Shari, and we'll talk about those evidences and things later, but I'll give it to you just four days. If you're staying four days or less, less than 20 salawat, then you can continue. If you're staying more, once you reach, then no more. Not that four days you can continue and then, no, no. Once you reach and you're muqeem, then khalas. Huh? But on the way, no doubt. And even there, you can make qasar and jama if you are going to stay there less than the shari amount. Or if you're going to stay there and you don't have an intent to stay there longer, but you are held against your will. Snowed in. Jihad. Got caught up and somebody put you in a, in a holding tank for some, even though you haven't done anything and so on. Then you don't have your, but if you have your niyyah to stay there more than four days, then once you get to the destination, you will not make qasr, you will not make jama. Inshallah, we'll stop there for the sake of time and continue this bab uh, at the next dars, inshallah.